All right, so, so what do we got? This is our last uh, 40 minutes before I will never see you guys again in an academic capacity. Uh, so questions that we have on our last moments before we go away for IB exam. Back in the back, what do we got? Okay, so on topic 12, yeah. uh, for the, like, the subtopic Cold War crisis, it says like Cold War crisis case studies. What does that mean? Okay, yeah, don't worry about that word case studies. It basically means we were supposed to have like covered a couple different Cold War crises in this class, and we did. And so all you have to do is make sure that you walk into that exam ready to address two Cold War crises from two different regions. So if, if you're at this point and you are getting ready for tomorrow, you are going to study the Cuban Missile Crisis and the, the first Berlin Crisis, uh, Berlin Blockade, Berlin Airlift, or the, the, the Berlin Wall and the uh, invasion of South Korea. We've got donuts. Um, so, so don't worry about the word case studies. That's just like we studied these. The, I just didn't necessarily call them case studies. All right, donuts. Come on in. You guys are messing up our video. All right, what other questions do we have? Oh, we have a video. Yeah. Get out. Yeah. Do you think we're ready? Do I think you're ready? No. Um, there's only one person that can answer this question. That is you. Um, I, I think you guys all should not, I think you all should walk into the exams knowing what to expect. Like literally, uh, I had a kid on, on, on one of my videos uh, ask me, do you have any predictions for what's gonna be on like paper, uh, uh, paper two about the Cold War? And I said, yeah, it's gonna be word for word from the bullets on the history guide. Uh, so if you know the bullets on the history guide, you know what the questions are gonna be. Um, Beyond that, it's, it's up to you to be ready or not to be ready. Um, but again, if we're, we're, at the, we're in this final hour or the final hours, be good with two leaders from two regions during the Cold War. I suggest you, you pick two guys that are contemporaries, uh, Stalin and Truman, or Gorbachev and Reagan. I like those two in particular as choices uh, because one's at the beginning of the Cold War, one's at the end of the Cold War, so you, you could double dip on possibly another question. Uh, paper three is the one I'm worried most about for you guys, because remember, paper three isn't gonna have the like the broad-based, very general questions where it's like, "Hey, tell me everything you know about the United States in World War II." There's a donut left. You're welcome. You want mommy to deliver it? What? Want me to deliver it? Someone else can have it if they want. Well, they want it, but do you want it? No. You? Oh, there's no mind. There's four left. Are you sure you want one? You can have a donut. There's four. I bought them with YouTube money. And literally, I'm making another video right now so I can buy more donuts. It's like a fair, it's like Inception. Um, so anyway, um, have a donut. Um, is everybody cool with that? So paper three is the one where you need to make sure you're looking at that history guide. You're going through the bullets, and if you're a little bit worried, we've got the, the, the readings on OneNote that you guys can take a look at, all right? Um, so make, if, if you're not comfortable with the bullets, you are not ready. If you look at those bullets and you're like, Psh, got it, you're ready. It's all on you. Questions? Uh, yeah? Okay, so one more thing on paper three. So like, is it all, like, a lot of history? No, okay, so paper two is, is 20th century topics. We've done topics 11 and 12. You're doing two essays from two different topics. So you're gonna do one essay from topic 11, so one 20th century wars question, and then you're gonna do one essay from topic 12, the Cold War. Paper three, that's history of the Americas. You did study some of that stuff in 11th grade. We also studied it in 12th grade. It's your decision, the curriculum is on one note. It's your decision, are you covering? Are you going back to review all the stuff you did last year? The more you know, the more options you're gonna have to write a paper. If, if let's say, let's say hypothetically that you were cryogenically frozen for your entire junior year and you were only thought out for this history class, you can still do paper three because you're gonna have a topic on World War II in the Americas and Cold War in the Americas. And we covered those topics, but you gotta look at those bullets to make sure you're comfortable. The nice thing about paper three is you do any three questions. So if you like both questions about the Cold War, good, do them both. Um, the problem is if you're only good with the stuff we did this year, you're gonna have to do three essays out of four questions. 
But then again, on the good side, you don't have to debate which ones to do because you get to do them all. Um, those of you that did an IA or an EE, you have carte blanche to, to look through the topics that you might have done an IA or an EE on to see if you're getting lucky. All right. Questions? Yeah. Okay, so I was watching like the World War One like review videos. Awesome. And I'm confused. This is kind of stupid, but like I'm confused. Like who the central powers are, who the allies are, who the triple alliance are, yeah. the triple entente. It, it, it is a little confusing. So so. Um, raise your hand if you have gone on to actually check out those World War I videos uh, because that's a war we should be good with because it's so big and so important, but you guys studied it last year, so that's old and we forget things. Um, so the alliances, you know, we, we've long talked, you learned way back in the day. Oh, oh my gosh, I got teacher appreciation <coughs> markers. I know. I, I've never felt more appreciated. The, the lounge, our copy room, holy smoke, did any of you guys have anything to do with that? I mean, I know some parents did. Were you there helping? It is beautiful. I've never felt like a, a, a more appreciated teacher than I did when I walked in this morning. So thank you for, for everything you did. And thank, you all, thank your parents for supporting the, the boosters if they did. And if they didn't, well, uh, I'm kidding. All right, so um, when, when we talk about World War I, uh, the reason World War I is like a really easy, easy subject to cover uh, for uh, paper for paper two for a war is because you could get a question about the causes of 20th century wars. World War I is a really easy one to do for the causes because you've got these long-term factors that students have long learned, militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism, and you could be asked about any of those things, right? Um, or you know, get a question like, to what extent was nationalism a cause of 20th century wars or whatever? You could have a question like that. Um, and then we bring in that assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand as like maybe an immediate short-term cause or other things like the Balkan crisis or whatnot. Again, if you listen to the, the videos online, you're good with that. The alliances is kind of interesting. The alliance is kind of interesting. So these alliances have developed long before the First World War. Uh, going back to the, the late 1800s, the original Entente or dual alliance between Germany and Austria-Hungary, Entente. Entente is a French word, right? Yeah, so we gotta remember that France is in the triple Entente or the dual Entente originally with Russia. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got a couple alliances forming. We've got Germany and uh, Austria-Hungary being an early alliance called the dual alliance. And then Russia and France being an early alliance uh, called the dual Entente. Um, and, and largely that's because France and Germany were rivals with each other, and Germany wanted an ally, Austria. France needed an ally, Russia, which would cause a, a split in the, uh, are we having a, a, a crossover <laughs> between IB goons? Maybe we can bring in their 14 yes. subscribers? All right, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> 14 subscribers. I'm sorry, how many you got now? Uh, I was like 250 Ten, maybe. I just went over 2,000. But like, <laughs> anyway, 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 um, we move on. So we've got, so do me a favor, Zelasko, if the word is alliance, it's the Germany side. If the word is entente, it's the allied side. But then the problem is, like eventually, Italy hops in to the dual alliance and it becomes the triple alliance, right? And, and, and so we've got this issue because when World War I actually starts, we want to remember that the dual alliance and the Entente, these are defensive military agreements, right? Defensive military alliances. Kind of like NATO. Like if one country in NATO is attacked, all NATO nations respond. That's a military defensive alliance, right? And so with the dual Entente and the triple alliance, those are defensive agreements. But who started World War I? Germany. Austria-Hungary and Germany, really. They were like the most aggressive powers at the start of World War I. And so when World War I started, Italy was looking at Austria attack Serbia and Germany invade Belgium. And they're like, well, we're not compelled to join this mess because we didn't, the, our allies didn't get attacked. They started the attacking. So Italy never joined the, uh, the, the war on the German and, uh, and Austrian side. Um, and that's why once the war begins, we don't call it the Triple Alliance anymore because that alliance falls apart. And we really just call it the Central Powers. They're in Central Europe. And then Ottoman Empire eventually joins that. Italy, what do they do? 
they joined the Entente powers. Uh, they wait a little while. This is a big debate. Should Italy get in or should Italy not get in? Uh, but they ultimately do join in on the Entente powers. Anyway, press on. What, other, what else we got? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, oh yeah. Paper one. Paper one, you're going to have four sources. That last question, that last question is going to have you write a, a straight up essay. You're going to have about 20 minutes left. You have to write a straight up essay. Here's the deal. On every paper two, paper three, or the last question of paper one, you've got to write real essays. There's going to be a real question. You've got to have a real answer. On papers two and three, you're supporting your real answer with evidence from your brain. On paper one, you're supporting your real answer to whatever that real question is with evidence from the sources and your brain. All four sources. Now, all four sources won't all agree with each other. You might have two or three sources that are leaning you towards one answer and then maybe one or two sources going another way. You still have to acknowledge the existence of all sources. Just like you will do on your other papers where you acknowledge the, an alternative perspective or a different idea. But don't let that trash your thesis. Don't be the kid that's like, here is my wonderful answer. Bah, 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 bah. And you build up this castle of brilliance. And then you take a sledgehammer to it with alternative ideas. And you can say, well, these are other ideas. No, be consistent with what your answer is. So you can say, Source L, however, disagrees and says this, but that doesn't take into consideration this, or that comes from a, a source that is you know, pro-Japan or something like that. You, you bring up what the source says, but then you let us know, let the reader know why that doesn't ultimately change your answer, why does, that doesn't undo all the work you already did. Great question. What else we got? Yes, sir. Um, so the essay paper one, would you use the, the evidence from the, the documents as more of like the general example of your clause and then use your previous knowledge to corroborate that, or would you do it the other way around? You, you are going to answer the question using evidence from the sources and from your own knowledge. The reality is you, have, you, you don't have a lot of time. You, you're probably going to have at most 20 minutes left to write this thing. If you pluck one idea as supporting evidence out of each of the four sources, and you have like one explained example from your own knowledge that's maybe not mentioned in the sources, you're good to go. You're good to go. Um, you're not gonna have a lot of time. That paper is usually going to be at most a couple pages, but for most students, somewhere between one and two full written pages. You don't have time for more than that. Uh, what else we got? Yes, ma'am. For the paper stuff, it's saying like any three questions in the exam. So Mm -hmm. That used to be a thing where they used to exclude the United States. They don't do that anymore. So if you have to write about, that's a great question. Yeah, you, you get a question about whether it's Cold War, Americas, whatever, and it's like any two countries, and you're like, yeah, I was kind of checking out when we talked about Canada and Latin America, but I feel good about the United States. So write the most that you can on the United States. You won't get a great score but you won't end up failing IB, okay? You, you just won't have two good examples. And let's say, let's say you know a lot about the United States, but only like a little bit about Canada or a little bit about Cuba. Put in what you know, you, you'll cover the bases, it won't be a perfect essay, uh, it, but it doesn't have to be balanced. If you lean heavier towards one side than the other, okay, it's not perfect, you're not gonna get 13 to 15, but most students aren't getting 13s to 15s. Get the most you can get. You guys work two years on this course, right? Don't, don't, don't think of the next two days as, wow, I get to go into to Rose Kid, take this test, and take the longest nap that I've been able to take in four years. No. Write as much as you can write for as long as you can write. Cool. Next question? Hey, there's one here. Yeah. Okay, so it's not like about my because it's like kind of more about life. Yeah. What do you got? Okay, well. Yeah. I understand what it is. Yeah. I just don't understand um, like when, why, it, why it was issued. Okay, so um, NSC 68 is, is the question. Um, what is it? National Security Council Report 68 says that the, uh, that the Soviet Union um, and communism is a monolithic threat, all being directed around the world to expand, uh, directed from Moscow. 
and, and we need to confront it. And it gives policy recommendations to the president. It doesn't mean anything. And a, a Security Council report is not actionable unless a president's going to do something with it. And so it's, these are the president, and president at the time in 1950 would be? Eisenhower. Or, or Truman. 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 No, not Eisenhower or Truman, just Truman in 1950. So um, it, it's up to the president to ultimately act on that. So um, they decide. The NSC 68 recommends like increased military spending to build up our military to defend against this communist expansion. Uh, why does it happen? This comes in the aftermath of China becoming communist, of the Soviet Union testing their atomic bomb, of, of the President of the United States, Truman, um, being called out by guys like Joseph McCarthy as being softer on communism. So this is all a part of that we need to, or, or we be, we're being made to take this communist threat much more seriously than we had in maybe the, the months or years before. So it's gonna cause a dramatic escalation. And then, right on the heels of that, we've got an invasion of, of South Korea by North Korea. And so we are, because of NSC 68, seeing that, not as some kind of nationalist Korean uniting Korea thing, we're seeing it as the Soviet Union, communism, pushing the expansion of communism from North Korea into South Korea. And the same thing with Vietnam. Like after NSC 68, we essentially take over the funding of France's war against the Viet Minh, right? Because we see that as again, and any communism around the world is the Soviet Union spreading. Now, what do you all know, now that we have all the history behind us? Was NSC 68 like accurate? Was communism like monolithic? No. Give me an example that would say there are varieties, and maybe not all of them are as, as, as dangerous to us as others. Yes? Um, possibly Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. Maybe it was more of a nationalist fight. Yeah. Yugoslavia. Maybe Yugoslavia is maybe the best example uh, early on, because they had a rift uh, right in the beginning. And then, of course, as we get a little bit later into our history, into the later 1950s, the Sino-Soviet split, when the Soviet Union and China are at, are at odds with each other. I can't make any good predictions of what you're going to see, but man, I do love telling my students to be ready for something about the Sino-Soviet split, or Sino-Soviet relations, or Sino-American relations. Yes, ma'am? Why is the Yugoslavian uh, communism? It's important because it's an example uh, that the Soviet Union didn't control global communism, that it wasn't like one monolithic communism. And, and remember, why are they different? Because the, the partisans in Yugoslavia, led by Tito, they liberated themselves from the Nazis. They drove the Nazis out of, of Yugoslavia themselves. So they never had the Soviet Red Army occupying Yugoslavia. So, so Joseph Stalin never had the ability to, uh, to pressure or to kind of force Tito uh, in the direction that he wanted to go. In all those other countries, through the, remember the baggage train and salami tactics? Soviet Union was orchestrating the communist leadership in all those other nations in Eastern Europe that they liberated. You couldn't do the same thing with Yugoslavia. So Yugoslavia is an example of a communist country that went its own way. Remember, Yugoslavia takes some Marshall Plan money, right? That well, Stalin was not a happy camper. Question. I, I had a quick question at the beginning. Someone was like, Truman Doctrine, Marshall Plan. Truman Doctrine, Marshall Plan. You really do want to think of them both together. Uh, in fact, Harry Truman said they were two halves of the same. Walnut, right? Because that's what guys from Missouri in the 50s said about things, or 40s said about things. The Truman, Do I think of uh, my, my landscaping example, right? The Truman Doctrine is you see a weed, or you see communism, you rip it out at the roots. And so we were pumping direct aid into countries like Greece and Turkey initially that we thought were being threatened by an immediate communist uprising. The Marshall Plan, that's our fertilizer. The Marshall Plan is us trying to maintain our lawn so weeds can't pop through, all right? So the Marshall Plan is let's pump aid, financial aid, not to countries where we're worried about an immediate revolution or anything like that, but to countries that are war-torn, that have economic problems, where there might be a possibility down the road of that country or those citizens being tempted by, by moving to communism. So let's rebuild roads and let's make sure their economy gets back on track. And guess what people don't do when there's nice roads and there's clean water and the toilets work and they have jobs? 
They don't rebel. They don't go to Communist Party meetings as much. They're not as big of a thing. Coolio, what else we got? Yeah. Um, can we just talk about uh, the Great Leap Forward's effect on um, China and its uh, attempt to go to communism? Absolutely. So the Great Leap Forward, um, they're already communist, right? Uh, so communism in, in 1949, Mao Zedong wins, right? His Great Leap Forward is his attempt to turn uh, China from a, like a peasant agricultural society to an industrial powerhouse using the greatest resource that China has, which is its people, its population. So they're going to turn all these Chinese peasants into Chinese steel makers, right? Steel producers. Um, what uh, the impact on the Cold War that that event, on China, it's devastating, right? Um, it, there's going to be, um, you know, not enough food produced, mass famine, uh, tens of millions of people are going to starve to death. It's embarrassing for Mao. But it's another one of those, like, those, those issues between China and the Soviet Union where, where the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, will, will call out Mao Zedong for being a fanatic. Like, this just looks really bad. Also, remember, Mao Zedong was continuing to ship rice overseas to other nations while his own people were starving to give the impression that they were in a better situation than they were, right? Um, so it just, it, it furthered that Sino-Soviet split, that rift between those two countries. Uh, what else we got? Yeah. Uh, we're kind of going back. Yeah. So I was like trying to go over World War I. Yeah. So I understand ideological, political, and territorial causes, but I don't really understand economic causes. Economic causes uh, for World War I, or really any war, we... When, remember, economics, like the defini definition of economics is how we human beings <coughs> figure out how to distribute uh, limited resources when there are maybe unlimited wants and needs. So think when, when you think about economic causes of war, think about like what are countries doing like that has anything to do with economics, like resource acquisition, right? And, and so this is coming on the heels. One of those causes for World War I uh, we could talk about imperialism, right? And imperialism, yeah, it was about national pride and things like that, but why were these countries trying to get these African colonies or any other overseas? For, for, their, for their empire to, to provide resources and markets for their industries, right? So that, that rivalry that starts with imperialism, that is at its core really an economic idea, all right? Um, so um, I, I, I don't know that for World War I, um, I, I probably wouldn't say economics are the biggest factor in war. I would probably dispute that if that's a challenge. But World War II, oh, oh, oh. Uh, the Great Depression leading to Japan and Italian and then German uh, desire for autarky, you guys remember that word, like to be self-sufficient, not have to rely on other nations, that's a big cause of World War II. Awesome. So I would say it's, it's a much bigger cause for World War II than World War I. And those, are, those become your best answers, guys. Um, when students are writing, and thank you so much for videotaping this. Um, the uh, videotaping. There's no tape. Man, we use all these antiquated things, right? I'm going to dial my mom on the phone later and tell her all about that. We don't dial phones anymore, do we? No. That's interesting. What was I saying? Oh. Um, <laughs> No, I forgot. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your best answers, when, when you have to do these like comparison questions or like to talk about two wars or whatever, your, your best responses are going to be the ones that offer more nuance to your answer. Like rather than saying, both Dominic and Nick are awesome guys. They each have brown hair. It's short. One's eyes are a little bit better than the other, uh, but, they're, but they're pretty equal height. One is a little bit more concerned about what time it is during the day than the other. Um, but, but anyway, we, like, your, your best answers are not comparing two things that are, like, you think are very similar. That's what a lot of students do. Both of these wars were like the most important things are both of, you know, to, to what extent was uh, technology the impact of, of uh, or a, a reason for victory in a 20th century war? A lot of students are going to be like, oh my gosh, technology is huge to this war, and it's huge to this war. No. Your best answers are going to be where you can choose a topic where it's like really important for one, but maybe not as important for the other, and then offer that good analysis as to why there was such a difference. Like American technology during Vietnam 
We're dropping bombs on dirt roads. We're dropping bombs on, on very uh, traditionally manufactured villages rather than modern industrial cities like we did in Japan or Germany during World War II. So your best choices are the ones where you might kind of challenge what the question is going for, at least on one of your options. Cool. Yeah? What was Brazil's role in World War II? Brazil's war in World War II. So, so that's going to come in on a conversation about the good neighbor policy, um, like where the United States is trying to keep everybody out of war. But then we come in to, once we're getting into World War II, Franklin Roosevelt is trying to get Brazil or other Latin American countries into war. And so Brazil becomes an important ally in the Americas. And remember, it's all relative. No one in the Americas is going to provide more for the Second World War in Europe and Asia than the United States and then secondary Canada, but really not even secondary Canada. That's only because their population was so much smaller. Canada was in World War II from day one, right? Um, so, uh, well, not quite day one, but right in 1939, Canada was there. Um, so Brazil is important. It's on the coast. They got a lot of resources. Um, they can give us more, they, they can help us have more easier access to Africa. So those landings that for Operation Torch, Brazil can be really helpful. Um, Brazil also provides rubber. Remember, rubber is one of the most important natural resources in the world, and it can only be grown in like tropical areas. And at the start of World War II, we, we aren't really mass producing synthetic rubber yet. So we need supplies for natural rubber and Brazil can do that. So we put a full court press to try to get Brazil into the war once, once uh, World War II starts. They ultimately do join that war for much of the same reason that the United States eventually joined World War I. German U-boats were sinking Brazilian shipping. And as time went on, Brazil got more and more crabby with that. What else we got? And, and there's a 10 minute video on my channel that's gonna talk about that, remind you of that. Yes? This is a dumb question. Yeah, I love them. I am really bad with like Japanese names and like Chinese names and writing them out and whoever's yeah. spelling. Since they do the whole like say the first name or last name first thing, yeah, can yeah. I just write like the first name? To Tojo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Yeah, that like, Hirohito. That, yeah, yeah, you don't have to do anything more than that. Uh, Mao, that, Jang, that, that's all fine. Spelling doesn't matter unless you spell Mao, J I A N G. All right? But if you spell Mao, Moo something like that. <laughs> the reader, we're going to figure it out. Now, is that if you spell Mao as Mu throughout your entire paper, are you going to get to the 13 to 15 mark then? No. But anybody that spells Mao as Mu isn't going to get there anyway. So that's not going to derail you. If you spell Mao, M-O-O, -O, can you still get like a 7 to 9 or a 10 to 12? Absolutely. So, so a minor spelling error, we readers, we, we overlook that stuff. The only issue is when, when your spelling makes it makes your reading distracting, like I can't get through it. Uh, as a reader, we get it. These are rough drafts, right? You're doing the best you can under very tight circumstances. So don't freak out if you, if you, if you can't remember how to spell something. Or, um, also, with, with your years, like uh, years are important. You should have some dates. Uh, uh, unlike many of you for prom, you should put some dates in. Ah, I'm kidding. It's 2019. You don't have to have dates for prom anymore. It's a new thing. I had to in high school, and that was different. Um, but um, but um, you should have. Like, you should be dropping some knowledge uh, via remembering that the Truman Doctrine was 1947 or something like that, or that the Soviet Union fell in 1991. It's, it's not a bad idea to have a couple dates. The most important dates to know about, if the years are in your curriculum guide, if the years are on that, that curriculum, for example, during the Cold War, they talk about superpower rivalries or cold, superpower tensions uh, from 1943 to 1949. 1943, you better know that's the Tehran conference, that first meeting of the big three. 1949, Berlin crisis, Soviets testing a bomb. You should know this thing. Um, on a later bullet, they mention specifically, like in superpower relations or whatever, they mention 1947. That's a year that they, they put on the curriculum, which means 1947 could be on the actual exam. You better know, Truman Doctrine was in 1947. Cool. Yeah. Um, could we say that like the Korean War had an effect on Sino? Absolutely, because Mao Zedong got that call from Stalin, he's gotta help out Kim Il-sung, and Mao's like, Arr! 
And then he does, and he does like pretty major. He sends a quarter of a million guys into North Korea, and and all Stalin does for him is provides him some loans that he's got to pay back with interest. Yes, it absolutely is a huge impact on the fraying relationship between between China and the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. Absolutely. And remember, Mao has hopes that Stalin might help him down the road regain Taiwan. Does that ever happen? The Soviet Union is never going to step up and help help China regain Taiwan. In part because we're defending Taiwan, and and does the Soviet Union, does Nikita Khrushchev want to go to nuclear war with the United States? No. What's what Nikita Khrushchev's policy towards dealing with the United States? Huh? But we got we can't just call it let them die out. We got to call it by what the language we used in our curriculum. It's called peaceful coexistence. Peaceful coexistence. No need to fight. They'll die out on their own. Okay. Let me let me say my last piece. You guys got this. All right. Um, you've been studying it for a couple of years, or at least the last couple of days. <laughs> and, and and you're going to get some options. Just right. Just right. The other day we shared that paper from that kid that talked about Cuba and, uh, and the, the Korean War. And it wasn't anything special. The kid didn't have a, a wealth of knowledge. He had some historical inaccuracies. I think many of you, most of you, all of you, are, are capable of writing beyond where that kid was. That kid got a 10. You walk out of two, with two 10s on your paper two, you're going to get a six on your IB exam, maybe a five. All right. You're allowed to screw up. You're allowed to have a bad essay. On paper three, you've got three good ess three essays. If you have two good ones and one, that's fine. You, you can survive. That is absolutely okay. All right. There's a lot of wiggle room. Yes. So how easy is it to get a four? How easy is it to get a four? I I've never taken the IB exam, so I can't really say that. But I'll tell you this. I mean, I don't ever name names, but I have some students that I'm like, ooh boy, this is going to be interesting and they get fours. We very rarely, I mean, we, we have a few threes every year. We have a few threes every year. And usually, I can peg who's getting a three. And usually, it's because, it's not you, um, <laughs> but anyway. Um, usually, it's the student who's just, you know, they started college a year and a half ago, and they're not doing this whole IB history thing. They're here most of the time, uh, some of the time. I don't know. But they, they, they're just not invested. So have you been here? Have you studied? Have you taken notes? Have you retested and actually like studied if you needed to? Um, have, are you preparing over this last week? You're good to go. You have nothing to worry about. I, this is not a class. This is the class that we tell everybody to take HL because we do really well with getting kids fours or higher. Sevens, psh, we don't get any sevens. But maybe someone's going to be different here. Yes? Dates can be stressful. Um, that we, we <laughs> over that um, his like essay and he like scored pretty high. And that he didn't have any like dates. So I'm not saying you have to have any. I'm I'm saying that kid's not not perfect. Like so if you can't do it, don't worry about it. Yeah, I mean like you, don't make stuff up. Don't 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 just you're you're better off not including it than including wrong information. But let's say you're like ah. I can't remember if the Berlin Wall went up in 61 or 62. So the early 60s. There we go. Yeah. You can ask me a content question. You know what? Um, I'm going to say goodbye to my our YouTube friends. Everybody say good luck on the IB exam. Good luck on the IB exam. Wow, they sound like they believe it. Actually, YouTube, they, they want you all to blow it so they look better. So uh, maybe we should make the Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, stop. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, what do you got?